ਤੇ ਕਿੱਤੇ ਦੀ ਪਰ ਇਸ ਨਾਲ ਮੇਕਿੰਗ ਇਨ ਸਾਊਂਡ ਹੈ Good evening and welcome to this evening edition of Chapter Chat. It's Tony with you once again, live from NAMI, where we're currently having our general chapter. And guess who's back? Everybody was wondering where he went. Good evening, Bonga. <laughs> Good evening, Tony. Yes, I'm back. Well, I, I didn't go anywhere. I've always been here. <laughs> but it's, it's good to be back. Greetings to our viewers. Great. Well, we haven't seen you on our chapter chat. But anyways, Bongo, we are very excited to welcome our guest this evening. Joining us from the wonderful country of Texas is Father Ron Rollheiser. Good evening, Father Ron, and welcome to Chapter Chat. Well, thanks, Tony and Bongo. Thanks for having me. Good. <laughs> and, and Texas is a state, but not a country yet. <laughs> <laughs> we are delighted to have you, Father Ron, and we're looking forward to an awesome 30 minutes with you. But before we do that, like we do every evening, Bonga, please give us an update of what happened today at the chapter. Well, a lot is happening, Tony, here in, in Nemi. Um, the spirit is moving. Um, as you will remember yesterday, uh, the, the chapter fathers were invited to take a Nemaus walk and they shared with themselves what moved their hearts. Um, and then today they gave that report back um, in groups, um, in language groups, and they presented uh, in the chapter hall this morning. After that, they went for regional groups uh, workshop, some kind of a workshop. Uh, and then they met again in the afternoon. They had a plenary session where they gave another feedback of what they had shared in those groups. Um, and the day terminated with a beautiful horizon um, and, and the Salva Regina. And we are going to have a social evening um, shortly after after chapter chat. It was a rich day, a lot of reflection, a lot of prayer and um, and feedback as well. Well, thank you. That seems that things are happening slowly but surely. Things are moving along. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, that's, that's, that's good, to, good to know. Good to know. Good. Ron, you've attended many general chapters before, haven't you? I've been at four. You've so. been at four. And currently, what are you doing? What is your ministry? Right now, I'm at the Albright School of Theology in San Antonio, Texas. And um, I was president here for 15 years. I stepped down last year. And now I'm a full-time professor in spirituality, uh, writing and directing a lot of doctoral students and, uh, and, and teaching a couple of classes a semester. Wow, very good. Mm-hmm. Now, four chapters you've attended, that's, uh, that's a lot. <laughs> um, uh, Tony, you, you had something to ask? Well, I have to say, for many years you've ministered at OST. Talk to us a little bit more about the ministry that the Albanians do at OST and what goes on there, because I know there's a lot of things just, just um, teaching. There's all, we have other projects going on around OST. Well, Tony, you know, because um, you're familiar with OST, but uh, the viewers aren't. Uh, we're pretty proud of OST. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, th this started as an oblate scholasticate and then morphed into kind of a, where the seminarians came. And then through the years, we've become an accredited theology school where we have, we probably have about 100, 120 seminarians a year from dioceses and different orders, usually about 15 oblates. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and that's part of our program. But now we have a lot of lay students here. We're ecumenical. We have a lot mm -hmm. of, you know, evangelical, other students coming here in, in our specialized programs. We have lay formation programs. We have a continued education program that reaches about 3,000 people a year. Um, mm -hmm. And we're one of the few, uh, in fact, we're the, the very few seminaries that have a PhD program that's accredited. We have a PhD program in spirituality. Um, but but also, Tony, we're very proud of the Charisma, you know, that in terms of... Uh, 
we really tried to keep the word oblate and the O mm -hmm. in the school. So we, we uh, reached out to a lot of people who uh, couldn't afford to be here. Last year, we gave out about a million dollars in scholarships. Oh. Um, we have a lot of people from the developing world here um, so that we, we look like the United Nations when you go into class. And, mm -hmm. um, um, and, and so that, for instance, with our, with our doctoral program, one of the reasons we started it is we have a lot of people from Vietnam, different parts of Africa, um, who, who wouldn't be able to get scholarships in some of the, like Notre Dame or Boston College because it's so competitive, not because mm -hmm. they aren't equal students. It's just that they don't know the American system. So we are training a lot of people are going to go back to the developing world. They're going to be the, some of the first sisters. Women in Vietnam are teaching in seminaries. Um, wow. And so... Um, you know, one of our board members, when I first came here, uh, he coined this. He said, rich Texas should be doing this for other parts of the world. And I kept quoting that to our board. So, and we give these people, we subsidize them completely. And uh, so I'm pretty proud of them. Uh, and also, we, 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 we try to keep the oblate part of, you know, the, our lifestyle, our campus. Um, you know, we, th th there's an oblate look to this. There's a mm -hmm. simplicity. There's an openness, an ecumenical openness, and uh, an openness to the poor. And um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I know that the American province is, is proud of this place. I'm proud to be here. Uh, it's a very, this, this isn't just an ordinary seminary. This is an oblate seminary. Mm -hmm. Amazing, amazing, amazing ministry there. Um, I just want to go back to the, to the, to the chapters because this is, this is what, what we are about, you know. Um, I would like to know, you've attended four chapters. What memories do you treasure of having participated in a general chapter? If there is any memory you have of, of, of those chapters, which one stood out for you and was the most powerful memory you, you can remember? I'll give you that. It's a good question, Bongo, but it's a little bit like asking a father, which kid of your kids do you like the best? You know? <laughs> <laughs> Just, you know, my first chapter, I was young, was in 1992. I was a young provincial. And, you know, I was taking stuff in more, you know, just you're, you're there. Um, then the second chapter, I got elected to the general council. So that, that was both a highlight and a, and a jolt to, to your life, you know? Um, and then the third chapter I went to, I got elected off the general council. <laughs> These are memories and so on. Um, and the fourth chapter was already here. Um, uh, you know, th those are personal memories, but, um, I'm looking at the documents. For instance, in, in 1992, that first chapter was that, I think we wrote a very fine, I'm still proud of that document, you know, ministering in apostolic community and so on, um, you know, where we we kind of stole this from Skillebex, but coined that great line, what you dream alone remains a dream, what you dream with others can become a reality and so on. Um, so I, I'm pretty proud of the work in, through the years, like the 92 chapter was special because I still got to meet Father Zago, you know, which was his last chapter. I think Zago was a unique and a very gifted man, and I'm proud to have had, you know, a little bit of his history and so on. Um, and then we elected Guillermo, and um, I served with him, and uh, and then we elected Louis, and um, and and probably if in those chapters, the election of a, of a general is usually the highlight. You know, mm -hmm. because it's, it's a major mm -hmm. shift in the audience. True, and true. So it'll be an yeah. interesting chapter because you have to elect the new general. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. And it's going back to, you know, the different themes of the chapters. Pilgrims of Hope and Communion is a theme that this chapter themes. How has this challenged or edified you as an oblate? Well, you know, it's always these titles, they're, they're, they're poetic. <laughs> and they carry a lot. Um, and this one, you know, it, it for me, the two words that, that was pilgrims, pilgrims mm -hmm. and hope, you know, that, that stand out. Um, pil pilgrims, um, you know, that, to me, the idea of pilgrim is you don't have a lasting city, you don't have a home, you don't have an address, you're, you're, you're walking, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and it can be an enjoyable walk. I walked the Camino once. I very much enjoyed it, you know. But you're a pilgrim. You're stopping at other places and so on. Um, you know, I've been an oblate for almost 60 years, and uh, this is the longest I've ever been at a place. You're five years here, and, um, 
And the thing is, after a while, you don't have a home. But the good thing is, every place is home after a while. You don't know what border or what country you're in. And I'm sure the two of you have the same thing at a certain point. It doesn't matter whether you're in Rome or Africa or, or United States or whatever. You're home. You're with the audience and so on. Yeah. Um, but the hope part is also strong, because especially being an obelite in the first world, mm -hmm. uh, in the secularized world where the obelites are aging, the obelites are dying in some way, you know, um, and uh, I mean, we're, we're, we're getting less and less than aging. And so the hope is what's new, you know, uh, I believe in the resurrection, we're not going to die. We're going to roll back some stones from the grave and we're going to keep it. <laughs> we're gonna have a, a new way of being. So hope, hope is is a big word here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Father Ron, you wrote a beautiful and, and challenging article on the chapter theme uh, entitled Leaving Nothing Undead. Uh, I found the first line of your article very captivating. You know, you, you like leaving nothing undead. At no other time in our history have these words been as urgent in terms of defining our challenge. Why are these words so urgent for us as Oblates of Mary Immaculate today? What major challenges are we facing as a congregation? Okay. Well, Bong, I'll take it in two parts. The first, you know, wh why is it so urgent today? Um, well, it, it's urgent, first of all, in terms of the world. You know, the, the world is secularizing. Um, and, and there's many good parts to that. But the world is, it's, it's not, we're not ministering like we were 100 or even 50 years ago. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's a completely new challenge in a digital world and, everything else and so on. Um, and then secondly, um, like, like, and I break it out, that the, the developing world and that secular world has a set of challenges for the oblates and um, the younger parts of the congregation have a, have a certain challenge. I'll break that down, but let's first work with the secularized world, North America, Western Europe, parts of Eastern Europe, Asia, and so on. Um, well, the, the the bottom line is that, you know, we're aging rapidly and we're not getting a lot of vocations and so on. And um, so our ministries are shrinking so that there's a real danger if we don't, you know, steady as steady as she goes, we're going to die out, you know, and uh, provinces are merging, the numbers and so on. And so th there's a need, as I say in the, in, the, in the article, there's a need to do something new, uh, mm -hmm. you know, um, and um, I use two images in there. Or the first image about Abraham and Sarah. You know, this, this is one of my favorite images, not just mm -hmm. for obelites, but for aging in general. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, there, there's this incredible image where when Sarah is 70 and Abraham is 80, God says, set out for a new land where you don't even know where you're going. Now, notice these are old people. These aren't 30-year-olds. Okay. So now, then it took him 20 years. So here's this elderly couple going for 20 years. And when they get there, she is 90 and he's 100. And they have they have Isaac, a real child. Now, Tony, I'm going to use some Texas terminology here. If you're in Texas, you have to say, what the hell is that all about? I mean, 90-year-old women don't have babies, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, obviously, that's a powerful, powerful faith image. You know, mm -hmm. I don't want to say metaphor because the metaphor means it's not true. It's true in a different sense. That's a faith image. But I, I see that as our as the obvious right now. Where our, our average age in the United States and North America and Northern Europe and so on and Asia, it is approaching 70 and 80. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so the idea is we have to set out and become pregnant in a new way. You know, I always say mm -hmm. that was a postmenopausal pregnancy. It was a new way of being generative, and mm -hmm. I think that's the, that's the real challenge. You know that um, um, that we are not going to go um, gently into the night, as the, as the poet says. And, and and I think our founder is to leave nothing undared. You know, so what I'm saying for the for the, the secularized world right now is not a time to be pulling back. Now mm -hmm. is the time. To, let's get some people and do some entirely new missions. Let's go where we've never been before. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, Let's go to inner city Las Vegas. <laughs> Do something, <laughs> Tony. You can volunteer for that. And so, on. <laughs> and I'm not sure what the R yet, but if we did, we, we'd be doing. But we need to find new ways. Uh, we need to do something new, and mm -hmm. um, uh, and we and that's going to be a risk. See, because mm -hmm. people think 
well, we're aging and you can't do this. And we, we shouldn't, you know, like if we play safe. And that was my second image, Bongo, where I said, you can die by hypothermia. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, that's, I like this image. You know, when, when people freeze to death, what happens is this. They get cold and the heart and lung panic. The heart and lungs panic. And they pull all the heat around the heart and lungs. And you go into mm -hmm. spasms and die. Mm -hmm. But see, organizations can do that, you know. We're aging, we're dying, so pull all the people and, 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 and play it safe and bring everybody home. Um, mm. It's hypothermia. You know, we're going to die, you know. Um, mm. And I used the image of the founder. When the founder had very few people, every prudential thing in the world to say, don't do this, he started sending people out. Sri Lanka, Canada, United States. <laughs> it was no. against, against all prudence. See, so prudence is going to kill us safety is going to kill us you know um you know like people um keep people sometimes we forget that safety is also a danger mm -hmm. <laughs> the danger of not being safe but safety is a major danger and that we, we can't play it safe we'll die by hypothermia and so i think we need to risk and i like that abraham sarah image simply mm -hmm. that you know um, we got We got to try some postmenopausal pregnancy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, yeah, that, that would have been my second question. In actual fact, what what's the answer then to all this? If you've answered, it's it's taking a risk and uh, uh, daring and and trying new things, as as you have said. Uh, yeah. That's, that's, yeah. that's beautiful. Yeah, it makes it makes a lot of sense. It's challenging, as I said, and I would like to um, invite our viewers, encourage them to. They will find your article on our website. It's it's there with the title "Leave Nothing Undead." Um, so you're most welcome to to read that, and I encourage you. It's it's worth it. It's, it's beautiful. Uh, yeah, Tony, you have something to. Well, no, I was just saying I was gonna. I said those images that he presented are very very powerful images, and yes. Leave nothing undared for the gospel. I think that's our motto. Um, Father Rao, what, what is the challenge in these words today? You think you've already answered a little bit um, for the aging parts of the congregation, more especially for the Oblates, say, in uh, Western Europe, North America, Australia, Japan, South Korea, and other parts of the congregation where our numbers are shrinking and our average age, as you've rightly said, is, is, is high. And we're receiving fewer vocations than before. What do you think are the challenges there? Okay, you know, I, I missed a little bit of the film, but I suspect you're asking for the younger parts of the congregation. Yeah, sure, yeah. sure. Well, there, in there, you, you, you the, the challenge of young life is very different than old life. <laughs> young life isn't going to die by hypothermia, you know. Mm -hmm. um, young life can die by not being focused enough. And see, I think there, the risk we have to take is, and it's a risk, um, and that is to keep moving towards the poor. You know, again, you, you go back to our founder. He was ordained and he went in southern France and there were so many needs, but he went to the people who weren't being served. And mm. uh, and, and, and that's what made the, the congregation bloom. And, and you know, and, and when I said that the, the, the risk is this. See, um, when we move towards the poor, uh, oftentimes we don't get the resources we need. So I'm going to give you a simple example. For instance, here in Texas, if you leave a big parish in Midland, well, you're losing all the revenue. And also at times that was a vocation part, you know. Mm -hmm. See, so if you move towards the poor, sometimes, you know, how are you going to eat? <laughs> Who's going to pay your bills? Who's going to yeah. pay for information? Um, you know, and, and where are you going to get your vocations from? Well, maybe the vocational will come and so on. So it's a big risk. And yet again, it has to be taken. It really has to be taken because um, um, uh, if, if we move away from our charism, um, we won't be faithful. I just believe that if we're faithful to what God asked us to do, God will provide. And I mm. think in, in um, the developing parts of the world, um, the push has to be to reach the poor. And I'll use an image in there, which I, I stole from the uh, from a history book. And, um, you know, we, we have, he sent me to bring good news to the poor, evangelize the poor. But I yeah. use an image from um, ancient England. You know, in, in England at the, at the time, I don't know exactly what, 
the, the years, but they would do social work this this way. The government would have didn't have social agencies, but the government would have you know kind of welfare, food, and so on. And the way they do it, they come to a region, and then they would the people would line up by the churches. So the Catholic priest would say, "All of you Catholics, come with me." The Anglican guy would say, "All you Anglicans, come with me." The Presbyterian, all you Presbyterians, come with me. The Quakers, all come with you. There'd be some people left over, and the Salvation Army guy would say, "Whoever has nobody, you come with me." for the army. All of you who have nobody else, you come with us. You're our people. Um, and see, I think that Eugene reached out to people. They had nobody. They had nobody, you know. Mm. Uh, and um, I've always been struck by that as to that make a great, you know, tagline for the audience. All of you people who nobody gives a care about <laughs> and you have nobody to support you, you come with us. You're our kind of people. Awesome. Yeah, all of you who don't have anybody, come with us. Uh, we need to incorporate that in, into our motto and, and take these uh, risks, as, as you have said. I see, Tony, we have a lot of um, people commenting on, on our chat. Yes, yes, I see. Uh, there is Yarek as well. There is Sibusi uh, Sodlamini, I think it's from South Africa. Uh, Yarek is in Canada. Uh, there is Paul Washington from Bloomfontaine is with us, and, and Victor Manuel. I think he's somewhere in the in the in the states. Um, yes, he's our yeah. vocation director, I believe. Yes. Okay. Uh, there is somebody from Sri Lanka as well, um, and Yarek has just written something. Ron wrote in the narrative for the regional Canada U.S. presentation at the OMI General Chapter. Our hope is based on God's promise. God's assurances that if we remain faithful, God will accomplish what is needed through our efforts. Our hope is based on the resurrection, trusting that God always brings forth life, even from one's dying. I think it, it, it repeats what, what we've been saying about the image of Sarah and, uh, and, um, and Abraham, uh, the God of the impossible, who can bring something out of uh, what is, what is uh, humanly speaking, is impossible. Yeah. Would you like to say something about that, Ron? Y yes, I I'm glad. Thanks, Yorick, for that question. Um, you know, I think sometimes we confuse hope. A lot of people, we confuse hope with wishful thinking or with unnatural optimism, you know. So wishful thinking. So it's, I wish I could win a lottery. Um, pardon me. I will hope I could win a lottery. You can't hope to win a lottery. You can wish to win a lottery. See, yeah. hope has to be based on something, okay? Or with optimism. You watch the news and looks better, it's getting better, you know, but hope isn't that. Um, you know, I'll tell you a great story on hope. Pierre Thierry de Chardin, the great Catholic, you know, scientist, mystic, so on, he was once giving a talk, and he was talking about how science and religion and all comes together, and it's going to be what we have in the Ephesians hymn about the end of time, and so someone said, well, that's, that's a very optimistic little scheme. He said, suppose we blow up the world with an atomic bomb. What happens then? And Teilhard said, that would be a million years setback. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he said, what I say is going to happen, he said, not because I wish it. He said, mm -hmm. because God promised it. And in the resurrection, God shows that God is going to back up this promise. Mm. If God can bring a dead body out of the grave, we're in good shape. I mean, we can trust. We can give ourselves over. Or uh, Nelson Mandela used to use this, uh, not Nelson Mandela, uh, Bishop Tutu, you know, at the height of our apartheid, people would try to intimidate him in his cathedral in, in um, Cape Town. He'd start his homily, and the soldiers would come up and line the two sides. And Tutu would smile at them and says, Well, I'm glad you came to church. I'm sure, your mothers are happy. <laughs> <laughs> but, but he said, Then he said, This is, I'm glad you came to join the winning side. He said, We have already won. He wasn't mm. talking about apartheid. Let's talk about the resurrection, you know. Yeah. See that we, with the resurrection, God put the final, basically like Julian of Norwich says, we can we can rest. All will be well, and all will be well, and every manner of being will be well. To which ask, ask, Oscar Wilde added the line said, and if it isn't well, it's still not the end. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you see that hope, hope is based on God's promise. 
and the resurrection verifies the promise. So, see, that gives us a base for trust. You can say, mm -hmm. I have a brother who's an oblate. He always says, if you die for a good reason, it's something you can live with. <laughs> you, know, you, you can trust it. So, so our um, Mother Teresa have a great line. Mother Teresa said, you don't have to be successful. You only have to be faithful. Faithful, yeah. Mm -hmm. See, yeah. if faithful, God's going to give us the future, what, what God wants to give to us, you know. So um, we don't have to worry about, you know, is it successful? We just have to pick what we're going to do and be very faithful to it. And knowing the resurrection, it's, it's going to work. It's going to work. And, and that's who we are, uh, Father Ron, is all place of Mary Immaculate. We, we're pilgrims of hope. We're pilgrims of hope. And what you've just said, I think, is summed up in this in this theme that we're reflecting on during these days of our general chapter. I think, Tony, you've got a very important question you, you have to ask Father Ron, you to, Father Ron tonight. Oh, yes. Tony. I have yeah. a very important question. Hello, can you, yeah. Yeah, a very, very important question for you, Father Ron. <laughs> okay. You, since you have all this wisdom, who do you think is going to be our next general chapter? Superior General. Well, well, Tony, I was actually hoping it was going to be you, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Good. So thank you. Thank you then to, to all our viewers and all those who have um, uh, commented on this program and continue following us. Uh, tomorrow we'll continue with another program in Spanish. I think we'll have somebody um, from uh, uh, the Spanish, Spanish speaking community will join us on, on Chapter Chat. Charles del Capitulo, as we call it in, in Spanish. Thank you very much, uh, Father Ron. Um, it's been a great pleasure having you. So thank you for um, allowing us to, to chat with you. I still have a very personal question I wanted to ask you. Uh, you know, I follow you and I receive your, your messages every day from the blog that you, you, you write your reflections. I would like to know what, what's your driving force? What inspires you on a daily basis? Well, that's that's an, <laughs> probably the hardest question you've been asked. You know, I hope it's faith and so on, but um, you know, sometimes you know we we're just we're just driven. You know, you you do it because that's what you're. You know, you have to yeah. set. I should be doing. You know, um, for instance, already was in a scholastic. I thought I need to write and publish books, and I just I got to do this. And you know, you it's kind of you do what you have to do, and. Um, and that has some downsides, you know. If you're if you're driven, um, so Tony, I hope you're driven on your thesis, right? Now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it's uh, it's it's harder to stop working than to start working. So, um, but uh, Bongo, I'll, I'll answer that question more fully offline with you. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> well, you've you've already answered, and we thank you for that. Thank you very much, Ron, and uh, all the best to you and in, in, in your ministry. Okay, we thank you. We'll be in Texas. Ciao. Yeah, we will. Thanks. Say the hi to everybody over there. Okay, thanks. We will. Thank thank you. We'll do that. <laughs> Bye. I think, our, I think our producer has got something to show us at the end of the show. Okay. Uh, a video that has been prepared somewhere. I, I don't know. It's a surprise, apparently, but they're showing us at the, at the end of the show. So thank you very much to all our viewers. Have a good evening. And to those who are just beginning their day, all the best. Have a fruitful day. Thank you, Tony, for being with us. Thank you. Tonight. Thank you. Good. God bless you all. Mabuhay! We are Oblate Post Novices of the Our Lady of the Assumption Scholasticate located at Quezon City in the Philippines. Aware that the congregation will have its 37th general chapter this year, we would like to present our response to its theme, Pilgrims of Hope in Communion. We would highlight the theme's significance for us as an intercultural formation community. We are all pilgrims, hoping to reach our destination, that is, to be with God. But we should reflect that God does not merely wait for us to approach Him, but He is actually with us in our journey. His grace and presence help us to carry on when our pilgrimage becomes full of hindrances and distractions. We might stumble on the way, but we can rise up and go forward.
Hope is one of the three theological virtues. It is not just about feeling positive despite great odds. It is more of believing that God's ways, which makes us better and wiser, surely prevails. Despite various and numerous challenges that affect our consecrated life and ministry, let us continue to hope in the Lord, for in Him we become clarified, creative, and courageous. To be in communion with God is our ultimate spiritual goal, but we can already have an experience of it here and now, when we are always in prayer, in service to our brothers and sisters, and in solidarity with our environment. We share a common home created for us by God. Thus, we should not only desire to be united with our Creator, but also desire to be united with the rest of His creation.